How's it going? Welcome to our latest edition of Coffee Talk. I'm Charles Neal. We have the privilege of having Pooja Mina with us today. Pooja is the general manager and executive vice president over at Effect TV. Pooja, how's it going today? Uh, very well, thank you. I really appreciate you having me. Oh, I'm glad you said yes. Are you kidding me? Uh, you know, we were talking a little while earlier and I said, I don't believe we haven't run into each other over the last few years. Maybe it was, I'm going I'm to call it the COVID years. That's the reason why it hasn't happened. But our circles are, are, are closer than we thought. And, and so the next set of events, I've got to reach out to make sure you're going to be there because we can't let that happen anymore. 100%. You will not lose me now that we've found each other. All right. There we go. Now, Pooja, I've looked over and I said, okay, you know what? I, I, I can't go through all of the accomplishments and roles you've had, even at the senior executive level. You've been doing this for a decade, a decade plus now, not decades. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so give us a little taste. Give us a highlight of, of, you know, where you've been, you know, the, the roles you've had. Um, yeah, no, happy to share a little bit about my, my, my journey. Um, I have worked at a lot of really big companies and some small ones too. Um, on the big company list, I've been at uh, Viacom, now known as Paramount. I spent time at Dow Jones and Company pre-acquisition. I was at the Walt Disney Company at ABC. Uh, and now I'm uh, incredibly proud to be at Comcast. And, you know, I think what's interesting is that over that journey through, through those various companies and others, um, I have had a lattice work career. And I didn't have the word for that until recently. I, I learned that from um, some of my HR colleagues at Comcast, but I have jumped around and done a lot of different things. And I actually think that that has been what has ultimately made my career what it has been and has been a big contributor to, to whatever success I've enjoyed. I started out in sales and sales management, um, but I moved into marketing and then I went back out of marketing into revenue leadership. Um, adding things like operations and biz dev. Uh, and then eventually I moved into general management at a smaller company called Truex that was an independent subsidiary of 21st Century Fox and then later went through some, some interesting acquisitions. <laughs> um, but all along there, the, the through lines there are that I have always looked for opportunities where I feel like I could learn more about things that I thought were interesting or important uh, for me to understand. Uh, I could solve problems that I thought were interesting and important to solve, and that I got the opportunity to work with and for people that I felt were inspiring and that I could really learn from and, and do great work with. So that's the through line. So speaking of that word inspire, you've been doing this for a while now in terms of executing in all of these different areas within an industry. What inspires you? You know, I mean, advertising, marketing, media, since you've gone through the gambit and have performed at a high level in high level roles, what's the inspiration that keeps you going daily? Uh, I, well, I'm lucky that I have lots of sources of inspiration. I think the things that sort of propel me and, and keep me engaged is one, I, I love solving puzzles and problems and this industry has no shortage of them. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Uh, I will never be bored. And I love that. I also, you know, it is very important to me. I love feeling of service. I love feeling like I'm helping others, um, like I'm solving something for someone else, like I'm helping somebody else be great. Um, that is incredibly um, enriching for me. It, it drives me. And it, as you move into management roles, it's really important that that drives you because if not, it can be a little exhausting and sometimes a bit thankless. Yeah. Um, but that is certainly part of it. And then, you know, like in terms of what's driven me to stay in, in media and advertising, First of all, there's a lot of people that are deeply cynical about our business, and I'm just not one of them. Uh, I think you can be cynical about things like advertising, but at the end of the day, advertising and the storytelling involved in the advertising business ultimately has a huge impact uh, on economies. It has a huge impact on people, uh, ad-supported content, and then you know the creative ads themselves shapes culture and our perceptions about culture. Um, it creates shared experiences because it's broadly available versus things that are only available to people that, you know, can pay a certain amount of money to get to it. Yeah. And then I've always just like, since I was a kid, I'm a big consumer of media. I love, you know, reading and consuming news. Um, I watch way more TV than I should. Um, and yeah. you know, I love what this industry produces. I'm a fan. Okay, uh, I'm shocked you're able to get up and watch TV. Are you kidding me? I, I, would I mean, I'm that. watching a lot of kids' TV these days because I got two little kids, but you know, I, I'm still there for the storytelling. I'm not mad at that. So tell me, when you look at, you know, holistically all of the experiences that you just described before, 
what are the different industry shifts and trends that you're seeing? I mean, right now, from a technology standpoint, you know, we're all over the place with the various AI engines, et cetera. How does that shape and form, how does that shape and form the new phase of storytelling when you have bots, et cetera, that can write stories, especially when we have, you know, uh, what I think is the, I think there's a strike right now going on. I don't know if you can talk about it. A writer strike, if you can't worry about it. But when you think about all of these things, what are the shifts and trends that you see from your purview, your perspective? So I think what's happening right now, because because you brought it up with with artificial intelligence, um, uh, it's it's really interesting. I I don't know exactly how that's going to shift everything, but you know I agree with I think the prevailing winds, which is that it's going to shift everything. It's sort of on the scale of the internet, or you know. Uh, the telephone, like it's it's gonna, there's there's not gonna be a part of the business that doesn't ultimately impact and a part of our experience in general. We just don't know exactly how it's gonna work yet. Yeah. Um, and that remains to be seen. I've learned not to predict the future. I mean, I'm wearing a smartwatch today, but I definitely didn't get here in a flying car, right? Some things people predict come true and some people, everything's everybody thinks are obviously gonna happen don't or they don't happen on that timeline. So, you know, like everyone else, I'm curious, I'm educating myself, I'm I'm imagining, uh, I'm excited. I'm a little trepidatious, but I really I don't know, and we'll, we will see. And there are already ways that AI plays a big role in our business. Uh, it just hasn't necessarily been as big as what it can be in the future. The things that I have been most focused on so far, though, are things that are more impacting my here and my now. So that's things like how data and automation are changing everything about the way that buyers and sellers of media do business together. Um, it's impacting the entire value chain. Um, Another trend, which is not new, but certainly important, is just the multi-screen world we live in and all the ways that uh, how we experience content and how we connect with advertising is changing. Um, The fact that it is becoming more digital and more dynamically ad-served doesn't just impact what a consumer sees and what they, where they consume, it impacts the entire business of advertising. What do we measure? How do we value it? Uh, how do we actually structure the transaction? So those are things that I really focus on. And then because everything went digital, the biggest thing that that unlocked was the opportunity to think in terms of audiences. Yep. And so the move to audience-based buying has tremendous impact on my business today. And it's something I'm really focused on. It's interesting because different parts of the industry, some are further along on that journey than others, It's but it's not a universal experience yet. I can tell I hit your sweet spot. You were, your, your yeah. eyes went up. You said, blah, blah, blah. right. And so- it's yeah, I can geek out about this. I got oh, to you know, rein it in. <laughs> a, what you talked about has such a wide array of skill sets that individuals will need to do the job, not not just current job, but the job of the future. What skill sets, when you look at individuals who are ready in your organization, who want to come to your organization, and want to progress, what are the skills that they need to develop to stay ahead of the curve? So I think a lot of those skills are, 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 are fundamental ones that translate across disciplines and across job functions and even to an extent across industries. Um, I didn't start out, I spent a lot of my career working in digital, but I didn't start out there. I started out in international print. Uh, you know, it's a different world. And when I first came into the digital world, which is after spending some time working in television marketing, I didn't understand the technology. I did not understand the jargon, uh, oh, the, the zillion acronyms, right? But what I came to realize is that, first of all, if you want to learn anything new and you're willing to put a sustained effort into it, you can, especially if there are people around you that are willing to teach you and support you in that. Um, but most business is just concepts. And once you got your head around those concepts, it's just learning the language. It's learning the jargon. It's, it's, it's learning the process. So you can figure all that out. I mean, things that I look for in, in people... Uh, I look for things like curiosity. I look for things uh, like drive, uh, judgment, uh, the ability to communicate and storytell, uh, the ability to really listen and hear what the other person is saying, not just the words, but the meaning. Uh, I think those are sort of things that transcend and are incredibly important skills. Uh, The ability to synthesize information that's disparate and actually make sense of it. That cuts across. Uh, And the way I think you learn those skills, because they're not like things you're born with, per se, you develop them all your life and we're all works in progress. I mean, I'm still learning those skills and practicing (laughs) them every day. And I hope to continue to is 
by putting yourself in opportunities where you get to flex them. Yeah. And sometimes you put yourself there and sometimes other people do that for you. And it's incredibly important, but you got to get a little bit outside your comfort zone if you really want to flex those skills. You know, I was I was thinking about your leadership style and what that would be, but I'm listening in and I can hear that basically you're saying just did all that and that's how I lead. I'm assuming because I heard servant leader earlier. Um, and so what is your leadership style? How would you define your leadership style today? I mean, and I'm going to context this in a manner that said, I can hear that there is a technical side in you, right? You, you're, you're, I'm geeking out. But when you're running a 2.8, let's just call it a $3 billion organization, you have to be willing and able to say, what's the probability of X, Y, Z happening? Not an absolute value. I got that. You know, statistically, what's going on here? How is that transformed? Can we put AI into this? That, and that? When, when you put all of that together, how do you lead A? How do you bring those dynamics into your leadership uh, style as well? Well, the first thing is I, I'm not leading this thing alone. I mean, let's be very clear on that. Uh, I have an incredible leadership team around me, and then they've got incredible leaders around them. So we're, 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 we're rowing this boat together. Um, and so the first thing is I would say that I, I think of my leadership style and certainly what I strive for it to be, it's collaborative. Mm. Um, you know, it is, it's not just about, oh, let me fix it. I, I know what to do. I'll solve the problem or here you fix it. It's you, on you. you go solve the problem. There, right. right? No, you know, <laughs> the, the people don't necessarily appreciate that. You know, when people get, bring me questions that are challenging or challenges, um, you know, the, the way to approach it is, do you, what are your ideas to solve this? Okay, you're not sure what to do. Let's figure this out together and let's get to a better outcome together or let's figure out how to take advantage of what feels like an opportunity together, how to address what feels like a problem together. And so I think that's a big piece of it. Um, but I, I actually recently met someone that taught me a new phrase, which was the uh, Shannon Cassidy taught me the concept of generous leadership. And I think that that is certainly what I try to practice and strive to practice. And to me, what that means is fundamentally, it's giving transparency and creating opportunity for others. Give them transparency and create opportunity. And that can manifest in so many ways. And so for me, it's about I give people context, right? Because if they have that broader perspective and they understand the why, they understand why things happen and they can bring that into their day to day. And then someday when they need a broader perspective to do that job of the future, they have it. Um, I think that it means um, thinking about who you hire, or who you tap to do what work, right? Creating opportunities for people that might not tick every box, but have most of it and saying, I will take you the rest of the way because I want your fresh perspective here, or because I actually think that with a little time, you could be better at this than anybody that does tick all the boxes today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about giving people like really fair feedback that's honest and direct, not just telling them how great they are. I mean, you gotta tell them how great they are and credit their work, but you gotta do the other thing too. So I, I think about, you know, at the end of the day, like I care deeply about the business, but I also care and try to consider the whole person. And yes. so that's where I focus my style. I can, I can, it it, it resonates out. I mean, it, that's, once again, when you go into that zone where, you know, we people don't understand, we don't do scripted here. And so when I'm asking these questions, <clears throat> I can see when you're going in and saying, no, let me just tell you what my day is like. And as you're going through your day, you'll pick them <laughs> up and thinking about your feedback you're having to give individuals, this is it. This is the passion and compassion that you have as a leader. And so for those listening, hear it for those in leadership roles understand that this is what makes a good leader um well it's one way right you've talked to so many leaders like i'd be curious like you know there are a lot of different ways to go about it but what are the through lines you hear from people um you know the the one of the big ones is empathy being empathetic mm -hmm. understanding that we're not all in the same place at the same time you have to meet people where they are yeah uh, and so that requires the empathy. If somebody comes in and says, listen, this is what's going on in my family right now. I can't do A, B, C, or D. And you're like, whatever. We have yeah. this. You're not going to have a, you may have individuals there, but they're going to be there for cash flow only. And when that emergency happens and you're looking at counting on them, they're going to say, no, the, the time clock's over. I have to go home. And if you get them to stay, once again, they're probably writing letters or emailing out to say, where's my next job going to be? Because if you're not leading with that empathy, if you're not a good communications person, um, if 
uh, you don't understand servant leadership if you don't have the ability to to delegate but delegate understanding that sometimes people are going to run into roadblocks. The reason you're delegating is for them to learn. If they knew it all, life would be perfect. It would be nirvana. And so when they run into those roadblocks and they bring it back to you, you can't say, don't bring me problems. That's mm -hmm. not the answer. The answer has to be, did you think through and now give me your summation of what the issue is? And then let's work we'll do it together. together like you said. But if you just try to run a blind eye and say, I don't want to hear that. Just bring me this. You're going to bring people into a robot mode and you're totally. going to get a lot of individuals who are not even as good as AI. They're just going to be robot. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Whatever you want to hear so I can get out of that meeting as opposed to being individuals who understand they can process and they'll bring out, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly so that you can come together and give you the best product humanly possible. Um, I love so that. Yeah, you know, that's the that's the privilege. Thanks for that question. That's the privilege that I get in talking to so many leaders is that sometimes you hear the same common themes, but then you're also able to bracket people into this is that and this is that. And so, you know, I can hear the empathy. I can hear the passion. I can hear certain things that says, OK, Pooja has got the right stuff here. You know, she's going to be able to have teams that are going to be willing to say, we got to pull an all nighter. She doesn't act for all nighters all the time. Y'all know how she is. Let's go ahead. Let's get together because it's obviously important. And, and most likely, you won't even have to tell them it's important. They're going to be good enough to know we have to get it done. So, no, I, you know, don't get me on my soapbox. We'll be here for a long time. No, I love it. I love it. What you said about empathy really resonated with me. It reminded me of something that actually somebody kind of had to. I, I didn't I didn't figure this out myself. I, I sort of got pointed in this direction over time, and but it was a really valuable thing I learned, which was you have to be really honest and vulnerable with people uh, as a leader, which sometimes feels antithetical because you're like, do you want to know that I, I'm not sure what to do here? <laughs> you know, is that going to make you feel better or worse if I tell you I don't know the answer either or uh, I'm not feeling so great today? Um, yeah. But you have to be honest and vulnerable with people because it gives them permission to be honest and vulnerable with you and, yes. and at work in general. And that's what we all really do need in this you know, world where we're integrating more of our lives at work and where the more of yourself you bring to work, the, 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 the better you actually are at work in every way. So that that to me took time to learn. You know, I'm going to be brief because I know we're on a time crunch here. But Pooja, probably about a couple of decades ago, I'm leading a team and we had to do layoffs. And I told my wife, you know, because this is now the second or third time uh, no, probably about the second time we had to do later at that scale. And I said, you know what? I don't, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't have these emotional bonds with the people who report to me any longer because it just is crushing when you have to let individuals go when it's at cause, not by them, but by other circumstances. Sure, sure. And she looks at me, she's like, yes, dear, knowing damn well that that wasn't going to be the case for a long period of time. And so, you know, X months later, you know, we're back at having a dinner party at my house and I'm having all of them come on. She's like, whatever happened to that? Not, you know, socializing. And I was like, I can't, I can't lead in that manner. My, my, I'm repulsed by not being able to lead in a certain manner because that's just who you are. That's in your DNA and, and trying to do something totally different goes against who you are down to the core of your DNA. It's going to be repulsive. You're not even going to be happy with yourself. So I I totally, right. you, you got to be able to bring your amazing self to work and you want everybody around you to be able to do the same thing. So amazing self, right? I'm going to, I'm going to ask one question before I get to amazing self, because I'm going to plant the seed about what's your superpower. Oh gosh. So you think about that for a second. But before I do that, you know, DE and I is, is at the core of what we do here at for Name It, right? Um, what, what? You know, for you, when you think about DEI, and especially this is this is AAP, uh, Asian Asian on. American Pacific Islander. Asian American Pacific Islander Mom. Oh my goodness. Okay, yes, it's AIP AAPI Mom. And when we think about DEI efforts, one thing I'll say is a lot of times people think that when we say diversity, that we mean black. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Black is not DEI. It's so many different components to it: gender, race. Um, ethnicity, da 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 line. When you think about DEI in I in your shop, how do you help um, 
promote it amongst your leaders so that it passes down and it just becomes um, a point of, of, of work. You know, it's just a lifestyle or a work style that, that your organization um, has adjusted to. When I say adjust, that's not the word I'm really looking for because I don't think that it should be an adjustment. It should just be a way of life. We all live on the same planet. We all drink and eat the same food for the most part, but we have to have this thing called DEI for a reason. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, we have to have it for a reason. How does it uh, work within uh, Effect TV? So at Effective um, and Comcast Advertising, even more broadly, um, it, DEI is incredibly important uh, for the company. It's a huge part of the culture that we have and the one that we are building and aspire to hold. Um, I know you had Lauren on your your show, so I won't talk about big Comcast because I think she did an incredible job uh, sharing the, the the larger parent company philosophy on this. But I, I would focus you on a couple things that we do. First of all, we think about diversity. Uh, there's visible diversity, and there's a lot of different forms of visible diversity. But there's also just diversity of experience and perspective. Uh, it's about uh, making space and welcoming those perspectives and realizing, you know, the thing uh, that. First of all, we we all want to feel that we can be ourselves, yeah. and that is how we thrive. Uh, it is also just good for business to create space to bring diverse perspectives in because we have, you know there's so much empirical evidence about how diverse teams make smarter and better decisions, uh, and it's so it's fundamentally besides the moral imperative of it, which I feel is just <laughs> goes without saying, it's the right the right thing right? to do to have a great experience on Earth. It, it is um, it is good for business. Uh, and, but you have to be deliberate about it because it is not something that is necessarily going to automatically happen because of structural and historical conscious and unconscious bias that has existed. So we try to be really thoughtful about how we not only create space for those conversations, we consider representation, we think about how we hire and how we move people through our organization, how we create opportunities for them. Um, one thing I am really impressed by and proud of that started within Comcast Advertising and Effective uh, was the Interview Allies program. And the idea is that we have for many interviews, certainly above a certain level, all interview processes have an ally, which is someone who is a trained employee. So it's it's a peer. It's, it's not, you know, some oversight from some corporate HR team. Uh, it's a peer somewhere else in the organization, but not in the hiring team. So they have knowledge of the business, uh, broadly speaking, who is there in the process, will meet the candidates, will be there for all the debriefs, and they're there to challenge the process. They're Mm -hmm. there to uh, look out for unconscious bias. They're there to make sure you don't press the easy button and hire somebody that's just like everybody else, that you consider other experience that we might want to be bringing in, other perspective, other backgrounds, whatever that might be. And, and their role is to really advocate and to ask questions and to probe and to make sure that we're all being true to the ideals we've set for ourselves, because it's really easy to, you know, sometimes find a reason not to or to snap back into what has been a comfortable pattern of behavior, you know, with no ill intent, but it's just a pattern. Yeah. And so uh, that program, I think, has really impacted decisions and has really impacted just general levels of awareness because you have these good conversations and so I think that's something very powerful we've done. It's just one example of how we're being really intentional. Comprehensive. That, <laughs> you know, when, when if I had to think of a theme or a word, just listening to our conversation, I'm thinking about the breadth of your experience, your knowledge, the wisdom that you're passing on, and it's comprehensive. So with that saying, that's my word for you for superpower. That you don't get it off. That's not the easy button for you. What's your superpower? It's a really hard one. I I don't like this question. I <laughs> I, um, I really don't. It's not I, it's not comfortable for me for some reason. Um, I think that one of my like a superpower that I I feel like I've got is um, being able to put things together to solve mm-hmm. the puzzle to integrate disparate pieces of information and you know figure out a new way to snap all the Lego pieces together. Yeah. I love doing it. It makes me happy. It's how I cook. Like I can't follow a recipe to save my life, but show me what's in the fridge and I'll play chopped with it myself and be like, what can I create out of this that will be on the table in 20 minutes? Um, but it's also the way I think I'm approaching my work. You know, I listen. I learn something from everybody I meet, uh, from pretty much everything I read, every conversation I have. 
And it's figuring out ways that I can synthesize that as I go through my my journey. And so I'd say that's my superpower. Okay, last question, because I know we have to go. At what point did you realize that was your superpower? Um, because Because sometimes the awareness comes early. Sometimes we just are going through it, but we really don't even realize that we had it. But right now you've just said this is what it is. So there was a period in time where you actually claimed it. Um, yeah, I think I might have just claimed it right now on this podcast. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I think um, I, I think I figured out pretty early on that I was a good dot connector. Like it helped me a lot in school, for example, a long, long time ago. Um, but actually, when I realized that it worked was when I put it together with another thing that I think is such a fundamental and important skill, which is storytelling. Because if you can find a way to connect all the dots in your head, but then you can explain it to somebody else, ideally in a story, because that is much more memorable and compelling than a bunch of facts or bullets or stats, then you can pass that on. And that's when it really gets exciting. And so I, I think uh, the time that I spent in marketing, because storytelling is at the heart of a lot of marketing, was really foundational for me. Pooja, it has been a pleasure. I have like another hour worth of questions, <laughs> but I know I have to let you go and I apologize for us going over. But um, obviously when we when we finally do get to meet in one of these great and wonderful places, whether it's Philly, New York, Atlanta, LA, wherever, we have a lot of conversation out because I have question after question because at the heart of what you said, a lot of, of those points resonate over um, through my personal experience as well as some of the individuals that, I, that we've talked about earlier. So. Thank you. Naomi Galan is proud to have you on our show and you do have an invite anytime you want to come back. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for letting me go over and ramble a little bit. Um, I appreciate the generosity of all your questions and uh, I look forward to when we get to meet up next. For sure. Yes. Thank you. Take care.